Signore e signori, buonasera. Welcome to New York University, Casa Italiana Zellini Marimò, for the presentation of David Scudero's book, Neorealist Architecture, Aesthetics of Dwelling in Post-War Italy. I have the great fortune that tonight, uh, chairing the works and coordinating the, uh, the presentation is one of our brilliant doctoral students, Alfa Guado, and I'm going to leave to him the pleasure of introducing the author of the book and the other uh, discussion that are going to be with him. Uh, Alfa Aguado comes to NYU from Chile via Barcelona with several degrees already before coming here for his PhD in Italian studies. And especially the study of architecture and history of art was at the center of his preparation before. And he has not abandoned that. His current dissertation that he's doing under the direction of Professor Forgas is on neorealist uh, cinema in Spain and Latin America. So there are many connections here that are coming all together. I just want to take the opportunity to say that how proud we are of our doctoral students, uh, that they are not only the people who come to our events, but they are the people who propose events and programs. The exhibit that you see upstairs now was curated by one of our doctoral students. Alf, of course, is a uh, portabandiera, and with him we had many, many uh, exciting um, initiatives that he not only promoted, but also coordinated them and brought to fruition. So just to say that what you see happening at the CAS is not the result of what I dream at night, but it's a result of a very engaged and engaging community of scholars, of students, of professors, and tonight is a proof of, of what they can do. So without further ado, I'm asking you to please welcome Alfa Aguado. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you, Stefano, for that. Super warm uh, welcome. Uh, thank you, of course, Casa Italiana, Stefano, Costia, um, Julian. Thank you to the department, everyone who helped me coordinate this, Ara, David, Julie, Esme. Um, yeah, I'm here. I'm a PhD student here in the Italian department. I work on neorealism. I work in a dissertation on the circulation of neorealism in Latin America and Spain, uh, just as Stefano said. Uh, and this is particularly exciting for me because I also happen to be an architect. Uh, I graduated uh, in architecture many years ago in Spain, and I consider myself a former architect or an ex-architect, just like an ex-convict, uh, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, I'm also happy to be doing this, also because I think this is an important book. Uh, there's been a trend recently in neorealist uh, studies. So the study of neorealism, I think it's starting to move beyond uh, the Italian borders. It's going beyond Italy and Italian culture. We're starting to see all these uh, works that look at how neorealism translated into other national contexts, into other uh, cultural um, latitudes, if you, will, if you will. But there's also like another trend that is looking at how neorealism translates beyond cinema and literature which are like the two traditional spheres when it comes to the study of neorealism. And there's this uh, book that was published recently by Charles Levitt, who um, said that, I mean, that book was presented, by the way, here in, in the Casa Italiana a couple of years ago, and it, it's a phenomenal book. And he talks about how neorealism was almost like a cultural conversation, a mood, as uh, David puts it in his book, and how it necessarily affected other spheres of culture. So. We can talk about like neorealist poetry, maybe neorealist uh, theater, maybe even neorealist paintings, and that's why I think this book is important because it it kind of asks the question right on, heads on: uh, Is there a neorealist architecture? Uh, there's been writing historically about neorealist architecture, but I think David does a great job at like unpacking uh, those two terms. Um, just a quick note on the format: I think. Uh, David is going to talk for 10 minutes, more or less. Uh, then we're going to put the chairs uh, here, and we're going to have a little bit of panel discussion with Professor Joan Ackman that visits our Casa Italiana from, um, from Yale. And I'm just going to give you the two bios, and then uh, I'll let the stage to David. So Joan Ackman is the Vincent Scully Visiting Professor in Architectural History at Yale, where she leads the PhD program in architecture. She's also a senior lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania, and previously she taught uh, for over two decades at Com University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, uh, where she served as director of the Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture between 94 and 2008. She has also held uh, teaching appointments at Harvard, Cooper Union, Cornell, the Graduate Center at CUNY, and the Berlage Institute in the Netherlands. 
Professor Ockman began her career at the Institute of Architecture and Urban Studies here in New York, where she was editor of the iconic, I would say, opposition's journal, and was responsible for the opposition's book series. Uh, and she has edited numerous publications, such as the award-winning anthology Architecture, Culture, 1943-1968, edited by Rizzoli, The Pragmatist uh, Imagination, Thinking About Things in the Making, Princeton Architectural Press, and Architecture School, Three Centuries of Educating Architects in North America, MIT Press. In 2003, she was honored by the American Institute of Architects for Collaborative Achievement, and in 2017, she was named a Fellow of the Society of Architectural Historians. So, super impressive, and we're very, very glad to have her here. Uh, professor David Escudero uh, is uh, a doctor and an architect, and an assistant professor at the School of Architecture of the Polytechnic University of Madrid in Spain as well as a member of the UPM's Cultural Landscape Research Group. Uh, and his research focuses on theories of architecture, landscape, and representation. In 2022, he was a Fulbright Fellow at the Getty Research Institute in LA, in Los Angeles. And he has also been a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley, at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, also known as the ETH in Zurich, as well as the Academia Nazionale di San Luca in Rome. Um, Escudero has published articles in the Journal of Architecture, published by RIBA, uh, the Architectural Theory Review, or the OAS, OASC Journal for Architecture, among others. So yeah, the book we're presenting today, Neorealist Architecture, um, Aesthetics of Dwelling in Postwar Italy, was published by Rutledge in 2022 and was awarded with a grant by the Graham Foundation in Chicago, and they're also co-sponsoring this event. So without further ado, <laughs> Let's welcome David Escudero. Thank you. Well, hello. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for, for having me here today. Well, this, this book is more than a pleasure, more than a, than a dream for me, and just Presenting it here in this beautiful place is, is far beyond that dream. So uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank the Casa Italiana for having me here, having all of us here and making possible this presentation. Also to Professor John Ockman, who I have admired for many years and, and just sharing this place with you is a, more than a horror for me. So thank you very much for accepting this, uh, this invitation. And also to Professor Alfa Guado, also uh, Professor Forgax, Professor Albertini, all the NYU team that uh, contributed to to provide the space, the, the, the opportunity for for us to to be here. Uh, I think also now the challenge is for me not to disappoint the audience after such a kind introduction. So I will I will try to to do that. Um, last, I can't forget the continuous support of the Graham Foundation and also the publisher Routledge. And without them, none of these uh, situations could be possible. So uh, thank them. Uh, so, wait, so I have here. OK, so here we have, uh, with a foreword by Professor Andy Rich, uh, here we have Neuralist Architecture, Aesthetics of Dwelling in Postwar Italy. As the title remarks, the book explores the relation between these two terms, architecture and neorealism. And the subtitle explains or introduces how it will be done. Uh, through the aesthetics of a very specific architecture, housing and new neighborhoods, of a very specific time, the post-war years, 40s and 50s, and in a very specific place, Italy. These are basically the keywords of this research. Um, so I'm a Spanish scholar writing a book in English about the Italian post-war, so maybe it deserves an explanation. It's rather an acquaintance. In 2013, I was uh, uh, doing my, my P no, not my, PhD, my, my thesis project, and it was located in Milan. It was a project in the Parco delle Basilique in, in, in South Milan. And I uh, had to study that moment, and I uh, felt attracted to this uh, situation after the war, this situation of the bombings, this old situation. And I noticed that all these years were frequently labeled as the years of neorealism. 
Apparently it was mainly linked to filmmaking, somehow to literature also, painting in a, in a way, and the term was not really clear then, nor is really clear now. But digging a little bit more, I realized that it was a kind of cultural environment in those years. And this idea of environment opened a frame for me, a frame in which I could uh, introduce my PhD dissertation, trying to connect these topics, all these uh, topics, with uh, this environment and study how or if uh, this environment permitted architecture. That was my dissertation, and this book is uh, its main result. Let's see if I can, okay. So in this sense, uh, it's a book that explores the transfer between neorealism as architect and architecture, as I said. Not so much about, uh, not so much about neorealist cinema, not so much about what neorealism was, and not so much about all the housing or projects, architectural projects in Italy in this, in this time. Uh, if this environment that we call neorealism existed, and it was shared by uh, different expressions of art, the book explores how it permitted architecture. An environment that seems always unclear. Mood, mindset, set of voices. Uh, we really cannot uh, approach it in a, in, a, in a very specific word. A kind of collective feeling that is there, that almost everyone knows that is there, but it's difficult to perceive in art and culture. So I could uh, not say in a minute what neorealism was. I, I couldn't at all. But I will, try to, I will try to explain why it's important today. Mm, many of, of you know how it originated in the field of literature during the 30s to express a kind of uh, re rejection against uh, a stylish, uh, stylish uh, trend on lyricism in, in some letters of uh, the 30s in Italy, and the trends toward, this trend towards everydayness joined uh, a kind of uh, imagery when cinema filmmaking put images after the World War II. Uh, when the cinema, the, the, those films, put images to this uh, destruction or, or housing shortage or this everydayness. However, I would say that filmmaking came after, afterwards. This environment was there before its images. That is, neorealism did exist as a cultural environment. And then filmmaking added images. And then only became part of it when it added images. So it kind of contributed to its imagery, to an imagery of something that was there before. Just as architecture did, and this is what I try to explore in this, in this book. In short, we approach neuralism as an environment, as I said, that is charged with images. An environment charged with images. But not only images, not only provided by filmmaking. Images that also come from literature, from poetry, from photography, from painting, from painting, and from architecture. This, in fact, is a photograph taken by uh, the architect and urbanist, renowned urbanist, Italo Insolera, who also was a, uh, an amateur photographer. So throughout the book, throughout the, book uh, the reader can see how difficult it is to interpret, to see the origin of every image. Where does it come from? Who took it? Who took it? For what purpose? It's even even difficult to to know how the image uh, was taken. If it becomes, if it comes from a film, if it comes from a photograph or an architectural reportage. So, okay, what why is this all this important today? Um, in this way, my my research is related to a, a trend that was described by Alfo very very well, a new wave of studies on neorealism and this time in Italy. That, a wave that since 2000 uh, is approaching neorealism precisely as a cultural moment charged with images. I picked some of the references. Also, Professor Forgax here has written something about this uh, moment and this kind of approach to the topic. And here we see Christopher Wastaff's uh, book on, on neorealist aesthetic in 
2005. Also, we see Mark Shields' book, who, who also was a, a reference for me, since he works a lot on, on the city. And then uh, Stefania Parigi's book on, on neorealist cinema. All of them with this approach uh, that opened a way uh, to further studies. As a result of this, in the last three, three years, this way of seeing neorealism as, the, as a cultural moment, as a cultural environment, uh, that permitted that art and culture has gained consistency. Here we see uh, a mentioned book by uh, Professor Awada and Professor Forgax, uh, uh, that is uh, Charles Levitt's uh, Italian Neorealism and Cultural History. It's uh, a really interesting book, also presented here at the Casa Italiana, which makes me very happy. And um, it's a needed book. It's a needed book that opened the way for uh, further studies on neorealism in other branches of art. Something that Antonella Russo did two years ago with uh, her famous uh, book, Italian Neuralist Photography, and something that I tried myself with this book. So I think there is a common ground here that is becoming important in these days, open to new and diverse approaches. So why are all these studies happening? Why is this happening? I would say mainly for two reasons. First, because a new wave of uh, cultural studies uh, is now very transversal, is a crossing paths between disciplines, and it's finding some values in crossing the, the, the topics between different branches of art in, in search of a kind of environmental connections. And neorealism is a good example of, this, of these interconnections, as Professor Albertini just said. And second, and probably more important, because uh, we are involved right now in such a virtual and abstract world in which we do not really know, we do not really understand how things work. And as some philosophers have pointed out, we are like kind of uh, lacking uh, engaging with our environment, we are lacking uh, an attachment from our context, and we are not really enjoying our everyday and its joy. So if we want to enrich our aesthetic experience, and definitely uh, we need it in these days, we must learn from those moments in which the human experience was at the core. And neorealism, again, is a great example of this. And how does the book uh, afford this? How architecture participated in all this? Well, this diagram tries to explain uh, its goals and achievements. In this circle, we identify uh, a starting point, this cultural environment, as I said. And this cultural environment created images, provided images. That is why cinema probably was the most visible phase of the trend, because it, it, it added actual images. Those images were absorbed by architecture. Architecture took images from this environment. The making of architecture was permitted by those images, especially collective housing projects, and especially those from the first stage of the Ina Casa program, one of the most, um, probably the most important in those years in Italy. And also, the neighborhoods, these new neighborhoods, provided new images. These new neighborhoods provided new images. Images related to architectural representation, drawings, photographs, reports published in architectural magazines, but also documentaries and films in which the neighborhoods, in which the architecture appeared. Those images formed an architectural imagery of these neighborhoods. And closing the circle, getting again to the neuralist environment, this architectural imagery became a part of it. In doing so, the idea of neuralist architecture could be bound up in a circle formed by these three themes. And this is reflected in the book. The table of contents, you can see it here, echoes this diagram. First part, the neuralist environment and the connection of the two terms, architecture and neuralism. Second part, how the making of architecture was permitted by neorealism. And third part, 
how representation added a neuralist layer to some projects. Just to finish, <laughs> just in time, I'm finishing right now, uh, I would like to highlight uh, that the book tries to, to join the discussion, to join the overall discussion from the field of architecture, rather than to make any strong statement. It, uh, it provides probably more questions than answers. It opens more ways than it closes. And I think that is one of its values. Uh, opening a window, let's say, to, to discuss with scholars from other disciplines, cultural studies, film studies, art history, um, critical heritage studies, we can uh, all together try to build a new, uh, not a story or not just a story, but a new frame for uh, neorealism. Uh, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't finish and I wouldn't like to finish without mention all the archives that I have consulted during my research during the last, during the last seven years, um, most of them in Italy, but not, also, not only in Italy. And that is why most of the 125 images that are in the book are unpublished. And I must thank uh, all the archives for uh, helping me and supporting me to dig in their, in their, in their documents. And well, I'm looking forward to hear what Joan and Alfo can, can provide, and I'm sure that I will learn a lot from them, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much for your attention, and I, think, I hope you find it interesting. Two mics, and if we need to talk to the mic so that people on the streaming uh, channel talk to us. So if you want to start with your phone, yeah. Uh, this is my bed? Yeah, no, I'll just turn it on. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, hi everyone, uh, and and thank you so much to the the casa for this invitation, and uh, and to David and and Alpha for the invitation uh, specifically, and David, congratulations on this book. Uh, a needed book. I, we, we really don't have a book uh, that is trying to think through a relationship between neorealism in film and neorealism, uh, if, uh, if it indeed can uh, be called that, in architecture. So uh, I'm, I'm very appreciative. The, uh, the images, as you just uh, told us, are uh, coming from all kinds of archives. We haven't seen many of them before, or most of them befo before, so that is such a pleasure. Uh, there's also a lot of unpublished uh, documentation in this book that's very valuable. So uh, I think scholars are, are very indebted to you. Um, OK, so uh, I, 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 this will be very free form. It's not, it's not uh, written out. Uh, and I'll, I'll say some things and maybe then pass the ball to, to Alpha or, 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 and David to respond. Uh, but a few things that. Uh, that I, I'd like to ask you about and comment on. So um, one of them uh, is periodization, fancy word uh, for you know historians. But um, the uh, uh, trying to 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 date this uh, neorealism in both film and architecture uh, for me and reading your book made this kind of very clear. Uh, the problem of what we can call uneven development. So um, in as much as uh, neorealism in film uh, seems to have its heyday uh, immediately after the war uh, in, the, in the second half of the 40s. Uh, but architecture, the architecture that, that 
we might connect, and that you do connect in your book to neorealism, um, comes at, it gets realized in the 50s. And of course, we suddenly realize with that that the disciplines of architecture and film differ in their timelines. Uh, architecture takes a lot longer to build, right? As, as you point out in the book, and, uh, but it hit me with uh, <laughs> as a kind of revelation when, when uh, I came across that and realized that the Inakaza uh, projects that you focus on and several others as well, all are built basically between 1949 and 1955 or 56, when arguably this environment or climate or mood or atmosphere and how we characterize it we could we can argue about um, was in a way already past uh, we're in the 50s uh, when those buildings are realized and uh, the ones that, that you were, were seeing on the screen just before and of course Italy has moved on Italy is in the famous miracle years uh, it's uh, has recovered from the trauma and the destruction of the war uh, with an infusion of uh, Marshall Plan aid and uh, all kinds of other um, help. And uh, by the 50s, it's perhaps more, uh, or it's more kind of involved in what gets Another key word, uh, aggiornamento, uh, updating, uh, becoming current with other things that are going on around the world, uh, not so much dealing with the immediacies, the urgencies, the experience of the, uh, of the period. And so uh, it's not surprising, uh, which is something that you talk about in the book, that uh, the architecture that emerges during the first half of the 50s is a little uncomfortable, um, a little nostalgic, uh, anachronistic, uh, apropos of uh, things that are moving forward. So um, draw, cr drawing this parallel between architecture and film, uh, we have this problem of unevenness. So how to resolve that? That, that would be uh, a question. I might start with. Maybe, maybe you want to speak to that a little bit. <laughs> well, um, it, it, it's a very difficult question to, to answer in, in, in a short period of, of time, but I would say uh, mainly two, two things about that. Uh, as I see, uh, or at least as I have approached, approached neorealism, uh, is not as a global trend, and uh, we have here even Professor Forgax who, have, uh, who has worked and on this, uh, but as a little window, little environment in which uh, this trend could happen, this uh, a few works, few people, but very intense uh, phenomenon could happen. Uh, why I'm saying this? Because even in the most intense years of uh, neorealist cinema, even in the peak, not uh, even the 20% of films were, neoreal were labeled or could be labeled as neorealist. So we are not talking about a global trend, but as a little current between some groups, leftist groups, uh, very, uh, very leftist indeed, and um, and the second uh, nuance I could add is, of course, archi this architecture comes out outdated. This architecture comes apparently very uh, anachronistic, as Joan uh, suggested. And indeed, the authors noticed that. Uh, the Quartier Tiburtino, for example, the, the, probably the, one of the best examples that we could mention, uh, is uh, designed in 1949, and it's finished in 1957 or 56. It depends on the on the little nuances. Uh, and the authors, even Quaroni wrote about this, in 1957, mm, kind of rejects the project. So it speaks of how fast in architecture w was everything. 
And uh, together with the Quartier Tiburtino, some other projects were designed in the 50, 51, 52. All, all the projects I, I, I talked about in the, in the book were designed in the early 50s. And in neuralism, in film, for example, we talk about a little uh, blurring time, a little dissolving time from the 51, 52, sometime until the 60 in, in some kind of uh, films, also in literature. Is, as, as John said, the beginning is very clear, but the finish is still unclear. And I think it will never be defined because there's no, uh, no agreement about that. But why did it happen? Uh, maybe because, as, as, as Professor uh, John said, architecture is really uh, difficult to um, be constructed very fast. Uh, Rossellini, for example, says in, in one of the quotes I, I, I put in the book that uh, Roma Cita Aperta was uh, shot with no money, with a camera on the on the street uh, filming and with no editing at all and in six months it was out and, and in the first uh, auction there were whistles uh, not so well received but it talks about how fast uh, cinema could be could arrive but before architecture could design a theoretical project before architecture could think about itself it had to mm, remove all the all the, the, the rests from the war. And these years were very interesting uh, to define an architectural uh, theory, if we can talk about theory, uh, even though it, it wasn't written, it was a, a, a built theory. Uh, we, can, we can, of course, discuss uh, more about this, but uh, I would say this as the first uh, thoughts. Yeah, I mean, if, if I can uh, tip in. I, I think, I mean, that's one of the first things I, I thought about this book is that um, there's almost like a lag between the periodization, the traditional periodization of uh, neorealism, which is like post-war, like people, there's a lot of debate about this, but is it like the early 50s, is it the late 40s, and the projects that you look at in this book, because those projects were thought of in the early 50s, but they were eventually built in the mid to late 50s. And also like the the, the social emergency that, that you talk about initially uh, and how like, this is like the post-war period, like people need to be uh, relocalized, they need to be given houses. Mm -hmm. By the time many of the Inner Casa projects are done, the housing has to do with migration and with the economic boom. It, has, it, it doesn't have to do with, with the crisis uh, brought up by the war. It has to do with actually the opposite, with a, with a, with a country that is kind of like developing way too quickly and out of control. So I, I totally agree with this, this idea of how hard it is to period, like the periodization, the, how hard it is to bracket the timing of this architecture and label it as neorealistic when by the time these buildings are being actually done, it's really, we're almost like in a totally, completely different phase culturally. And then the other thing which is, has to do with style that you, you brought up, how some of these buildings look like anachronistic or I, for me, that was like one of the best parts of the book to see these buildings that are that they can have like uh, tiled rooftops and they have like cute little windows and they're trying to be like folkloric and, and peasant like, and I think that that's, that is really like a good argument to make that this architecture was neorealistic because a, a, a very important part of neorealist rhetoric was populism and was this idea that we're returning to the people we're kind of like. It was almost like a response to, I think I said that in one of my, uh, in my email, that it's almost like a response to the international uh, like modernist movement. We don't want the flat rooftop, we want like the cute little tiled uh, rooftop. We want, so, sorry, so if you, I don't know if you want to tip in on that, on but, style. But, but of course, fascism also purported to be populist, right? Yeah, uh, so yeah. So uh, the, the problem is to, uh, to be populist without being uh, exactly. fascist. And, yeah. and uh, so, uh, if I can um, move on to it, a yes, please, yeah. comment here that I, the, the book focuses very uh, narrowly on architecture and film uh, in relation to neorealism. 
But I, I want to argue a little bit for mm -hmm. widening the lens mm -hmm. <laughs> and trying to uh, see this uh, Italian neorealism in a wider context, a European context in particular, uh, and one that also, in terms of time, um, has antecedents in yeah. populism in the fascist mm -hmm. yeah. era, uh, and in in every way has to distinguish itself from what went before, but has also affinities with other things going on in Europe, and and, and maybe through a kind of comparative lens, it's possible to figure out what is unique or what is specific to it, uh, neorealism in architecture in Italy. So, um, Johnny, if you could talk to the mic. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will do that. All right. So, uh, just to mention two important discourses that come out of World War II. Um, that in architecture. So one of them is indeed the new humanism, so-called. You talk uh, in the book about the new empiricism, which is specifically associated with things that are going on in Scandinavia and Sweden. Sweden had remained neutral during the war and so continued to build during the war and it had also rejected kind of doctrinaire uh, ideologically codified modern architecture as that had been defined. And so right after the war, not surprising that other countries, in particular England and Italy, are looking to Sweden for this, this new empiricism, uh, again, as a, a kind of um, uh, critique or uh, resistance to, uh, to a, a very abstract, rationalist, modern architecture. We should mention, for maybe non-architecture uh, people here, rationalism is a synonym for modernism in the Italian context. The modern movement is known as rationalism. So um, the new humanism after the war, which includes the new empiricism, uh, has to do with a sense that uh, modern architecture has been over hyper-rationalist, utilitarian, functionalist, and has left out the, the human dimension of architecture. And of course, this feeling after a period of, of destruction and trauma and need for reconstruction is uh, felt very deeply. Uh, so not just in Italy, but really uh, all over, we see uh, different versions of this new humanist emer humanism emerging. In particular, we see it in the, the International Congresses for Modern Architecture, the SIAM, which is the great organization institution that is, uh, arraigns itself as the standard bearer of modern architecture, founded in 1928 in Switzerland. But then after World War II, uh, needing to uh, re-examine its mission uh, to determine whether, how to go forward in the post-war period. And so meeting for the first time in 1947 in Bridgewater, England, and really asking the question is, is an organization like this one needed in this period and how should it change? And again, this theme of a new humanism that needs to be introduced into the ideology of modern architecture, needs to inflect architecture going forward, is, comes to the fore, uh, especially uh, through a, uh, a, a, an emerging generation of architects. And the generational issue is very important here, and I think it is in Italy as well. But uh, the sense of a generational succession that the interwar period has um, represents the first phase of modern architecture, but now a need to evolve and evolve in the direction, in a more humanistic direction. And so we get uh, things, uh, people at, at, at this Congress in, Bur in Bridgewater asking, how do we make modern architecture more available, acceptable, and um, empathetic to uh, ordinary people, and this discourse starts to becomes known eventually as to the man in the street. But it has to do with again uh, having a new protagonist, a new subject after World War II. 
Then specifically in the Italian context, of course, that new subject who emerges after the war is very much somebody connected with the resistance, with partisans, and uh, uh, seen as a new hero, a heroic figure, the little man who is the salt of the earth, right, who now has to be designed for somehow, or attended to, or documented, all of those things in any new architecture going forward. But, uh, but again, one can find it in other contexts as, as well. It's the specific context of the uh, resistance in Italy that gives, I think, a particular coloration to, uh, to what appears uh, in, in Italy. Uh, but again, there, there are comparable things going on elsewhere. So I think, again, it's helpful to, to think about this new humanism and the new subject of modern architecture who emerges after the war. Um, Okay, the second um, important new discourse that, that is related to the new humanism is something called a new monumentality. So uh, famously during the war, kind of manifesto statement uh, is uh, written to get by, by three uh, European uh, exiles who are sort of sitting it out in New York during, during the war. Uh, coming together, it's Siegfried Gideon and the painter, Fernand Léger, and the Spanish architect, Jose Luis Sert, who come together and they write something called Nine Points on Monumentality. And what they're calling for, and it seems uh, incredible that they would call for something like this, is a new monumentality. Uh, one would think that, you know, after a period of, of fascist monumentality and Nazi monumentality, that'd be the last thing on anybody's mind. But what they realize is that, again, modern architecture has failed to move the kind of hearts and minds of ordinary people. Uh, so how can it do that? And so the emphasis is really on new. Of course, in an Italian context, again, specifically, this poses real problems because mo monumentality is so much associated with Piacentini and a whole uh, monumentalism in Italy. It's really dangerous topic. So Alpha, when you talk about, uh, sorry, the, the, the pitched roofs on the towers in uh, the, the big housing, uh, one of the big housing projects uh, in uh, Rome, Viale Etiopia, um, it has to be a monumentality that doesn't look like the classical, bombastic, rhetorical monumentality uh, of the fascist period, uh, but is more a glorification, heroization, again, of a vernacular, a vernacular context. So we get towers, we get tall buildings, so they're, they are monumental in the, in the case of that project. But they don't look like anything that would have been designed in the, in the 30s. And, uh, and, and issues of you know, vernacular, spontaneity, and yeah. uh, a way of life that has to do with the the common person, the, 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 that salt of the earth uh, person, whether uh, somebody from an agrarian context who's now come to the city or somebody um, more urban who's now being settled on the peripheries of cities, uh, all of that is uh, part of this uh, project of finding an image, finding a representation for that but it has to be weighed against the uh, fascist monumentality that pre-existed. So that kind of special uh, specificity, again, apropos of neorealism, I think is, is one to think through. All right, um, much more to say, but gonna, I don't wanna... I don't wanna just one thing to add before Alpha uh, makes a, a contribution. I'm astonished right now because you gave a key that I didn't know so far, I recognize it, and if uh, you remember in the book when, when all this conversation in 1955 when Aldo Rossi and Guido Canella write, wrote um, uh, Arquitectura e Realismo, they uh, criticize a lot uh, all these new neighborhoods that are coming up with this uh, tradition, and they are recognizing their uh, 
putting some value in the renewal of the references against fascism. They think that it's good, a renewal, and proposing a new kind of architecture. But they don't like the, uh, the, the, the little villages that are coming as a reference. They think that the references, the, the, the trend is good, but the references are, are, are wrong. And they put the, the, the finger on, the, they signal the Viale Etiopia Towers. And you just said, why? Because they, they think that some kind of monumentality is needed to, to, in, in, in a way to embody the new architecture, but they don't like the Tiburtino. They like the, the towers in Viale Etiopia in a way that Alfa also recognized. So I just learned a lot from, from, all the, from the comment, and I thank you very much. <laughs> No, I mean, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, my, my only like, question and w what's hard to grapple with is how, like, we, we, we understand that after the war, there was the, like, this cultural mu movement that was like a new humanism, a new interest in, in the human being, in, in, the, in the man of the people, in the common man. The question is how architecture can be realistic. So architecture is not a representational medium. You're not seeing narrative. You're not seeing uh, uh, representation, represented figures. You're not seeing it's. It's very abstract. It's like an, an art that is always like between art and function that is inhabited. So how can we talk about architecture being realistic? Like when is it not? When is it fictional? And that is that, that is really hard for me. I'm, I'm not saying I'm not saying you have the answer. And this is almost like not at all. <laughs> yeah, but it, it is. Because I, I do agree, I mean, one of the things that your book uh, clarified for me is that when these guys were working on these projects, they never used the word neorealism. This was always a label that, in the aftermath, critical scholarship applied to the moment. Because this was like the neorealist moment, you know? Everyone was interested in, in kind of helping the people in, in this new humanism that, that Joan was talking about. But, but at the moment, they were not talking about uh, realism. So to what extent this is like just like a forced label that we're imposing just to understand the moment? And to what extent it's really like realistic? How is architecture realistic? And I, this is a loaded question, but if you want um, to try to I, I would say that there were some kind of strategies that were unconscious, but pointed uh, towards the human being being at the center. Of, yeah. of the issue, of the question. And that points to some kind of realism indeed, in a way to, in a way against abstraction. Yeah. And I, I will explain it. For example, when the Inacasa program has to define how thousands of dwelling, dwellings had to be designed, they said that at the center where was the human being, their psychological well-being, and the physical well-being, the pleasure of being in the house, for example. And also, indeed, in, in, the, in this beginning of the program, in, when, when the manuals were being drafted, there was a kind of confrontation between Puglioni, Foschini, Libera, all these people involved, to decide which tone, which way <laughs> of architecture should be followed, industrialized architecture or architecture in which the craftsmanship, yeah. the, 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 all the, these uh, little, little de yeah. details, vernacular, the rooftops, all these w could be uh, fostered. Mm -hmm. And they decided to foster vernacular architecture, yeah. not to um, replicate all these open blocks, all, uh, uh, all equal to each other, like the Borgata. Also, we, uh, we yeah, can't exactly. forget that the Borgata uh, represented this kind of architecture and also fascist architecture. So, in a way, Italy, and answering to your previous also question, Italy was in a very specific moment. Italy was uh, was one of the two countries that lost the war, and unlike uh, the others, unlike France, unlike England, and like uh, all the others, Spain wasn't even in the map. <laughs> but, it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> but um, it's interesting to 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 study how Italy in that moment had to create an identity as a country mm -hmm. after 20 years of fascism. And in that precise way, they had to design a known 
identity, to design an own artifact. And in that role, and in that game, the Inakasa played a, a huge role as a, a really an, an artifact of creating a nation. And today, every little town, every little city has a, at least an Inakasa project. And as, as uh, Beretta Anguizola, the, the, the book is really, really well known, says, once you know our Inakasa neighborhood, you know that it's an Inakasa neighborhood. Just that created a, 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 little, a little nuance of an identity of a country that, again, fostered human being at the center, feeling at, at, in, a, in a known climate, yeah. and becoming, of a, uh, becoming part of a program that provided houses for migrants, but also for people who were poor or who were in a very uh, uh, not safe situation. And the last thing I, I would like to say about this is that uh, I think this is a kind of reflection I, I do in the book. Uh, if we again relate the moment as a particular moment in Italy, I would say that the relation, the interrelation between the arts is unique in Italy. That's why we call neorealist cinema, that's why we call neorealist literature, because there is this kind of environment, of course, belong, belonging to a further and large environment in Europe, the new humanism, which is uh, happening in these years, but also we are talking about a very unique uh, climate in art. In art, understood as literature, painting, photography, and in a way that, relating again to the Ina Casa, it's interesting for me to see how the characters of the films, the spectators are the, and the, in the cinema, and, the, uh, and the, the, the actors who play the roles could be the very same persons. All the, the characters of the films, the actors in the the non-professional actors in the film, and the spectators in the in the cinema could be the very same persons, and all of them could be living in a, in an in a house uh, neighborhood. So these crossed relations between the people, because the the, the 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 little man, the little woman that is at the center, is really interesting for me at least. And this is of course not realist architecture, but it puts the, the human experience in the center, mm -hmm. which for me is essential to talk about neorealism. Okay, uh, a, lot, a, a number of interesting things <coughs> that you just raised. Apropos of interrelations between different arts, um, that too is something that is happening in a wider context and in fact very much part of that whole new monumentality discourse is something called the synthesis of the arts and what's being called for again are these kind of great civic centers where all the different arts come together to produce something. But I, the question about realism is, is really uh, a, a, an interesting one and a problematic one, I think. And I mean, what is realism? It's, a, it's an attitude toward reality uh, that um, manifests in style sometimes, in, in a particular aesthetic, but there are different realisms. Socialist realism, of course, is another one that is very much um, on the scene uh, at this moment in time. And in fact, um, kind of the elephant in the room for me in, in relation to this conversation is the Cold War. Uh, and a, the conflict that's going on between the Soviet Union and the United States for uh, a sphere of influence in, in, in Italy. And certainly neorealism is connected with a left-wing intellectual um, culture and is, uh, sees itself as anti-capitalist in many ways, anti-consumer society. Uh, we also know, and of course in film also, uh, that Hollywood is, you know, uh, competing uh, against uh, this rather small uh, and intellectual e elite production that, you know, paradoxically is all about populism, but is being received essentially by an intellectual yeah. Yeah. audience. Uh, I'm talking about neorealism. Um, but in any case, uh, Apropos of realism, I think we can think about two things that, that make sense of it in relation to architecture. First of all, the, the, a kind of study of a way of life, um, you know, uh, even a kind of sociology, sociological or 
scientific approach to vernacular. Yeah. So, and we see evidence of that in another, in France, for example, we have Henri Lefebvre during, during the war years who is going into villages in France and documenting things. And so an architecture that would be based on that kind of knowledge, scientific knowledge, I think is part of this. Although kind of contradiction of that is there's a certain kind of picturesque quality to this vernacular as well that doesn't have that sort of scientific uh, imprimatur associated with it so much. So these are kind of competing tendencies. The second uh, issue that can be associated with, with realism and neorealism in particular, and this is the tack that Manfredo Tafuri takes, is the desire after the war for an architecture that communicates, that has meaning that is apprehensible. Again, against the kind of abstraction and geometric, uh, you know, uh, formalism of, of interwar architecture, uh, an architecture that, uh, you know, speaks to the emotions and, and architecture parlant in an old sense, uh, but now reinvented to, again, have a different subject in mind, namely this, uh, this working class uh, subject. So that kind of communicative value that it's striving for through images and, and materiality that can speak to a local population uh, seems very much at the, at the heart of this. Yeah. Again, apropos of this problem of anachronism, though, by the time it speaks to those people, or tries to speak to those people, those people are more interested in Olivetti typewriters and you know, high design casino furniture and, and, and so forth. So um, you know, it may not send the message that was originally intended. Yeah, uh, sorry, just on that point, uh, you, like, what, one of the things that, uh, that you're that made me think is that this idea that uh, these images, like many of these buildings, and this happens a lot in the book, feel neorealistic because of the images, because of how they are communicated. And they are all communicated, I mean, if you guys get the book, they're all communicated in beautiful, amazing black and white pictures, you know, that really remind us of the movies that we all love. And I, I, I was wondering as I was reading, like, what if we went now to one of these buildings and took a picture with our I, I, iPhone? Would they still, those buildings, would they still be neorealistic? If they were like in color and they just had someone, you know, smoking a joint down there. It's, 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 it's hard to, to separate the, the way these buildings are represented in these images and in this period from our idea of neorealism. So I, again, I, I wonder if, this idea of neorealism is in the pictures, or is it in the buildings per se? You know, that's that's one of the questions I posed to you in in in, in my email. Sorry. Yeah. yeah uh, uh, let me say real quick before you yeah. respond to that. Another contradiction, it seems to me, apropos of images, is that it, what is desired, it seems to me, is no mediation, no image in between. You know, um, the building yeah. or even even the movie and my response to it, that I, everything isn't going to be filtered through the media of, you know, of the image of suspect. We're looking for some kind of authenticity, genuineness. I mean, that, that's part of this, this whole kind of ambiance. So how the image works in that case seems to me a little bit paradoxical. Well. There are some well, difficult, difficult things to, to answer again. And uh, I would say that it's not images separately. It's the imagery which is consistent as a visual archive. It's the sum of images which constructed neorealism, not just one. And, uh, and in this way, how the projects were represented throughout different media, even uh, Coroni was a screenwriter from another uh, documentary. The, this crisscrossing relations between the actual projects and how they were represented is what constructs this imagery. And this is one of the thesis of the, thesis of the book in the, the third yeah, part, yeah. especially exactly. how all and, and it's the, the circle that I projected before. Uh, the only intention that I have is to transmit how 
all these sum of images joined the architectural imagery. And this, yeah. all these images that you are seeing right now in the loop, in a way, joined the neorealist imagery, contributed to, no, to, 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 no, to making no difference between an image coming from Roma Cita Perta, from any other neorealist film, a, a representation, a photograph taken of the Quartier Tiburtino by Italian Solera or, or any other uh, representation of these projects. So that's uh, it's not, not maybe how the image mediates, but how the sum of images constructed an imagery. And this imagery became part of the neuralist environment. And if we go now to these uh, neighborhoods, we will identify them as a brand of modern movement maybe, maybe, maybe as an alternative of, of, the, of modernism, uh, as, a, as, a, as a larger part. But this, is, uh, this leveling is probably something that historiography made, yeah. makes. Uh, with Baroque or with uh, Renaissance architecture, there are different, different levels. And probably we are just talking about, I don't know, 10, 50 projects yeah. We probably today we, we wouldn't receive that, but that's the role of historiography. This is just opening the path to yeah. point out that this may be a situation that might be studied from the field of historiography, <coughs> art history, or developing some kind of studies in favor of a broader <laughs> movement. But of course, I'm not saying at all, and I would like to clarify this, that this was the main architecture that this was the main style at all. At the same time, they were Gio Ponti, uh, Caccia Dominioni, Luigi Moretti, Asnago Bender, I was just speaking Italian, all these other architects that were promoting other kind of architecture. So uh, we're just focusing on a little, uh, a little environment, uh, just as in the movies, a little uh, trend of some few movies that were so intense and so, so influential because even, even in, in reaction to them, Aldo Rossi, for example, constructed his theoretical project. Just because he was angry with this project, he was uh, constructing his theory uh, against uh, this bunch of references that these projects provided. Yeah. They are necessary also as, a, as counter examples. Yeah. They are necessary as a rejection. Without them, probably Aldo Rossi wouldn't have uh, provoked, uh, wouldn't have been provoked, and wouldn't have uh, fostered his, uh, his also communicating architecture, like, like Tafuri very wisely, very smart, uh, identified. So uh, in a way, it's a little few, a little small, small world of uh, intensity, of influence, of environment, but very influential as a counter example. Can I say something very quick? Uh, it just, I, I think that's great. It's, it's actually, and that's like what's amazing about the third chapter, is that you're, you're trying to say not that these buildings were neorealistic, but that the, the images that these buildings produced contributed to the imagery of neorealism. So I, I'm almost like tempted to suggest that the book is called Architectural Neorealism rather than Neorealist Architecture, you know? <laughs> so it's like the neorealist, the neorealism is being architecturalized. You know, not the other way around. It's not that the buildings. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm kind of like joking here. I'm not like, no, no, I'm not no, seriously no. suggesting that you change the style of your book. That could be the next book. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's, um, I mean, I mean, that's great. How, how images in, in reality, these buildings are just producing images. That's interesting. And, and of course, are period images. They're period and they're images from the moment. So yeah. it makes no sense to think of these buildings now. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know, do you have, well, and, yeah. You know, and, and of course we know what an important role photography has played in the history of architecture. And um, just to, again, uh, compare a different context, but I'm thinking about these photographs that Nigel Henderson, a, a, a British photographer, took of the East End of London uh, slums. And these photographs that he took, black and white, which of course have that, mm -hmm always that intensity uh, the, that Peter and Alison Smithson then yeah. bring to SIM conference in 1953. And 
it's a, you know, it's a revelation to many people. And combined with that are photographs from North Africa that some other architects, Candilis, Josek, and Woods, took and brought also to that same con. So image, I mean, we, 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 we're entering an image saturated culture, of course, and so this is, in a way, part, yeah. of, part of that story. Um, film, the, whole, the relationship between film and architecture is, you know, all other subject, we'd have to have another uh, evening to talk about that. Uh, but I, I, I also am interested in the moving image in relation to the three-dimensional architecture uh, image and um, think back to uh, an early, you know, analogy between these two disciplines drawn by Walter Benjamin and the work of art in the age of McKenna, where he talks about the fact that both architecture and film are uh, received or perceived in a mode of distraction. Um, and he's not talking about architecture with capital A, the kind that, you know, a tourist looking in front, in front of a famous building, but the way architecture is the kind of wallpaper of our life, uh, just as in watching a film, the images are going by so quickly, we can't sit and contemplate one like we can, a still black and white photograph. So, um, but that relationship is, um, you know, another story. But this mode of distraction also, I think, is something to think about in relation to uh, this question of staging a, a look, giving this, creating this image of mm -hmm. neorealism. And again, I think we get a problem of authenticity that is Im implicit in that. So, you know, here we have now highly trained architects, uh, technologically sophisticated, formally very adept, who are now trying to design architecture without architects, architecture that looks like no architect. So there's this kind of a, a scenography, you know, a staging of this look. So that problem in relation to the image, I think, is very much raised by this vernacularism uh, in, in neorealism that film, the film doesn't raise, but architecture certainly does. Yeah, that's great. I think we're running a little bit late up to, uh, uh, out of time, but I want to take questions from the audience. Uh, we have like two here. I think we're going to be helped um, by someone. In the meantime, just for the record, let me say that, the, I mean, the research is amazing. You've done a phenomenal, we haven't said that, it's not that we haven't said that enough, we haven't said that yet. And you've done so much work, you've visited so many archives, you managed so many, such a vast sway of material. It's really impressive. I'm super jealous and it's great. So congratulations. We should have said that early on. Thank you. And yeah, sorry, no, please. We want to talk to the audience. So there's two questions here. Who has the question? Thank you so much for this incredible conversation. And I'm really looking forward to uh, reading the book. Um, up to now, the discussion has been around trained architects in, in this period, and with some references to vernacular architecture. But I'm curious to know if you've treated in this book um, the vernacular architecture of slum life that is so prevalent in neorealist imagery um, of the barake. I mean, is this something that you treat um, and look at with any kind of seriousness um, in the book? Um, it didn't really play a, a, a role, and I think it, it's because um, the book focused probably on this, uh, how to say, in this fabric of the architecture world and this environment of neorealism, but not so much about uh, anonymous uh, neighborhoods, anonymous uh, vernacular architecture, but rather on uh, how the protagonists of these neighborhoods were looking at the environment uh, around them. So mm, definitely it's, it's a reference, but it could become so difficult to, to look uh, around without knowing so well where to look at. I, I don't know if, if it's clear enough that, but 
if we are looking to anonymous architecture, where should we begin looking at? It's, a, it's like another kind of, of research that could be, of course, done, and, and it's open. It, it opens the way to to try to find out these kind of references that, of course, for example, Rossi uh, neglected after after or with Canella. Uh, they they both were uh, when they was uh, when they were students at the the Polimi, uh, they rejected this uh, vernacular architecture in favor of this Viale Etiopia that John uh, marked. But it's a, it's a very very good question, and and thank you thank you very much because. It, it could open a, a brand, a branch uh, on this research. Um, and thank you for this conversation. It's very stimulating. Um, we, my wife and I have, have been spending a lot of time in Rome. I'm originally from Rome. So um, a couple of questions about Rome and uh, uh, the architecture there. Um, one is about um, the impact of Ina, Ina Casa, as a project. I, I understand that it was very big impact throughout Italy. If you could give us a sense of uh, how big that was, how many uh, projects or how many apartments were built within that project, or just a sense of uh, how much um, housing uh, was created to respond to this big demand for housing. In Rome specifically? Throughout Italy and in Rome particularly. And then I have another point about Rome? Uh, throughout Italy, in the, in the 14 years of the INA program, it was nearly uh, 300,000 uh, dwellings, which is a lot. So if, if I'm not wrong, maybe this is something more, something uh, less. But uh, definitely in, in, in the book, indeed, um, in the last uh, pages, it says, it suggests that further research could be done in how... Uh, how important was this neorealist environment as something unique in Rome, as something even more reductive from Rome and different from other places. But precisely the INA, the INA program made it possible to like spread the movement throughout Italy. Because as I, as I said before, even, uh, almost every place in, in Italy has an INA neighborhood. And also, there's a, a, a nuance that I could highlight here, and the book not focuses so much on the whole process, on the whole 14 years, the due centennial, but in the first, the first centennial, until 1957, in which the centennial changes. Indeed, Adalberto Libera is the director of the technical office until 1951, so again, we are back in the first comment. It's a very flashing uh, movement, and after 1951, 52, Le Andreotti, Legge Andreotti, um, there's something going on in the 51, 52 that uh, fosters a kind of blurring of everything, but the INA proje projects are still there until the 57 being constructed and being, and of course in Rome, Villa Gordiani, all this, uh, you know, even in Ostia, all this, this neighborhood, uh, Stella Polare, uh, all these other um, uh, projects, Tuscolano, of course, the Quartier Tuscolano, the Tiburtino. There are so many of them that provided new images again to this imagery. So in, in fact, in Rome, there was kind of a, 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 a highly interactive uh, trend of this phenomenon. One, one last point, since yeah, we are sure. about to go to... Uh, Rome in about two weeks, oh, and so yeah. are there particular neighborhoods that you suggest that we look at to kind of see the the, the period of history? Yeah, that you are there describing? are two uh, mainly addressed in the book: the Quartier Tiburtino, uh, in the Via Tiburtina, kilometer seven, seven. <laughs> a, a really slow bus that will take you there, <laughs> and the Via Etiopia in the Campo Nomentano. Okay, uh, Viale, the one Via Etiopia. Uh, that is not in a casa. No, that the, is for the Ina employees. Oh, for the INA employees. That's, it's an INA commitment for the INA employees to Mario Ridolfi um, and Wolfgang It's Wolfram interesting Tanto. because the name itself uh, says that this is part of the Quartiere Africano, it, which started, of course, during fascism. Yeah. But so this of development course. was created within that same area. It uh, is. Expanding it but, or replacing it, buildings that were there? No, it was ex novo. But there's a, a really interesting thing about this neighborhood. This is uh, really, uh, well, these blocks uh, in Viale Etiopia. And it was the situation in front of it, in the Campo Nomentano. 
it was a really frontier, a great frontier between the Quartier Africano and the Campo Nomentano. And there was shot Il Tetto by Vittorio De Sica. And the last shot, the last shot of the movie shows the house being almost constructed when the policemen arrive and they check that everything is all right to allow the construction to be up there. Uh, yeah. right there. Yeah. This is the scene. Yeah. And at the back of this scene, there are the towers in Viale Teopia. So again, representation is creating an, Im an image of a project related to Maria Ridolfi. It's, it's a maze. It's a maze of relations. And in this project, as Joan said, there are two things. One, the new monumentality that doesn't remember, that doesn't recall the fascism mon monumentality, which is amazing, and I learned that today. And I sus suspected that, but I learned it today from you, and thank you very much for that. And the other is how representation created all this situation in front of the towers where Sabatini, for example, the, the screenwriter of Il Teto with the Sica, spent two years going every day to the Campo Nomentano to see the Baraque and to learn of how they lived, to write the screen, the, 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 the screen write? Yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah, for this movie. So it's the intensity of neorealism was there with Sabatini, with the Sica, with the Barake, and also well, many other things. There are, uh, one documentary that I uh, talk about in, about in the book shows the, the Barake and then turns the camera and shows the towers at the same time. And the, the, the children from the Barake we're playing with the children from the tower. <laughs> so it's like coming again together, which is these crossing relations is what I think that are more powerful than any uh, linear discourse on this topic. Thank you. We have one more question, two more questions. <laughs> and then I, I'm afraid to have to over there. I'm sorry to be. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much for this most invigorating <laughs> conversation. I long ago uh, came to the conclusion that what interested me more than architecture with a capital A was whether common elements, the anonymous architecture you're talking about, could make a place, a place where you'd want to be. And with the realism or neorealism architecture in Italy, I haven't found it. Much of what I was looking at tonight seemed to me that they could have been slides in a medical lab buildings that seem to have no relationship with each other. And at the same time, what interested me in the United States were the common elements that make us American. You know, the front yard, the fact that the above grade pool is in the backyard, for instance, the, the green ribbon of the front lawn, all of these things. And then from that point, could you make a great place? And I think the answer is you can. But I haven't seen it with this. The, the slide that's on the screen right now is an excellent example of this. I, I can't find a place. And I wonder if we were to put a, uh, a blindfold on you and flew you around for 24 hours and then dropped you, could you tell instantly that you were in, in, in Italy? And if you could, what would be the clues? What would wow. tell you that you were? I, now, it's, we're not going to drop you on the Campidoglio or in the Grand Canal, it's in this new suburban part of so many of these big cities. Well, well, that's a really, really different, difficult, difficult question. I would, I would say maybe you could, if you drop me in a specific location, maybe it's true. But um, in the Quartier di Urtina, I could imagine. Um, there are some, uh, some. Clues in a not 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 so much about Italian space, but about Mediterranean space, Southern Europe space, European space, that at least make you think that you're in Europe. For example, that's why we created the European Union. One of the reasons, of course. There's some other links among us that if you drop me in Greece, in Turkey, Israel, or Morocco, or coast of Spain, I could say I'm in, Medi in the Mediterranean. Italy as a point could be identified maybe maybe with some kind of uh, urban elements, uh, for example the, the, the clothing outside the street 
or some kind of references. But maybe you need to be Italian to, for, for that. As, as, as you as American probably would identify easily your own space. But for me, I'm Spanish. Uh, for me, I would identify an European space, probably not an Italian space. But have you, have you got a place where you'd like to live? <laughs> well, maybe, maybe. I don't know. Um, but interesting, interesting question. Thank you. Thank you. Final question. Then. You see someone doing like that? It's it. <laughs> yeah, the gestures, the talking. Yeah. As Italian, I can say, yes. You can <laughs> recognize the difference between Mate being in Matera la Martello, being uh, in, uh, in Roma Tiburtina. Yes, there are differences. Um, what I find interesting and um, kind of a proactively interesting of this kind of research and of your work is not just the conversation and the study about work by itself understood in its context and as the conversation tonight as a self-referential, but as a kind of a key to read some of the things that are still happening today. So the contrast between the tower and the, and the, and the baraka is still in Brazil, is still in Africa, is still in many other places. So what I found, I think we should focus uh, more on what do we learn from this to do better today or to deal differently today or to read, understand, decode better because of the tradition, what we learn from this, in several contexts that are coming back from wars again, and they are still in wars again, and what's happening there, and what is the neorealism that is beside the lush architecture and uh, the different production that we see in the star system, is still happening there, neorealism. It's not just the 40s, the 50s in Italy. It's 2020, 2023 in the south of the world. And this should be also something we should, as architects, as designers, as a theoretician, we should think about that. What can we do to a small action to change, this ch to change and modify this chain, chain of events? action and reaction that lead us still in the same places today. And what, how, what is the difference of our neorealism from that neorealism? I don't think we are that far from it, unfortunately, I would say, in some cases. In other cases, it's a good thing. Thank you. Well, I, I don't know how to answer to this, but uh, um, uh, in one minute. Uh, maybe one, one uh, I was talking about this with John before, and one strategy could be to be critical again, to be able to educate the new generations to position in a strong, critical, uh, again, position uh, formed with history and theory, which is now, uh, also we, we have talked about this before, how it's been uh, rejected from many architectural programs or architectural education. And as architects, we need to know this. We need to know why this was successful and why this failed. We have talked about this. This probably failed because the bunch of references were wrong or were not accurate or some people thought were wrong. Okay, but it was successful in providing good neighborhoods, good communities, good relations between people. And that was the objective beyond architecture. This is, uh, of course, sometimes very stylist, very elitist conversation. Outside architecture, I can tell you that people living here are very happy. I, I, uh, the, the relation, the net of relations that these neighborhoods provide were great for them. Other thing is that us, we as an architect, can think that, okay, the references were wrong. We, we could have designed them in other way. Okay, but one of the goals in that, in that moment, in, in this moment, was to provide good homes and, and place the human experience at the center. And there's one quote, and I will, will just finish with this, from Giovanni Astengo in the, in the book, then talking about the Quartier Tiburtino, that you will visit in two weeks. He said, um, one can, could feel attached to, his cor to its corner. Just feeling attached to its corner it's a great sensation provided by an architect. And also Quaroni, the author, who seven years later rejected the project and, and talked bad about, badly about the project, said, okay, but it was in, in, a, in, in Easter, I think, or, or some, something around Easter, 
and he visited the, the neighborhood, and he wrote about it, and he rejected the architecture, he rejected all the group of architects that created it, but he said, but still, there is life in the neighborhood. So we should learn about that. Beyond the stylistic trend, beyond, as you suggest, we should learn in the critical position of this neighborhood to be, to be real, in reality, to propose solutions from the knowledge of theory and history, as also John suggested. This is the key for me in this moment of, of, of virtuality, of abstraction, of crisscrossing on, on transversality between studies. Architecture is probably becoming not so important as design, but important as, uh, as fostering relations between people, which is now probably very important since the appearance of internet, or all this virtuality, of this lack of contact between people after COVID. <laughs> I would say that. Uh, we're gonna close before we clap, and I hope we all clap. Uh, there are a few books on sale uh, upstairs. Uh, it's a steal, it's only 30 bucks. So if you're interested, you're welcome to buy one. And thank you very much, uh, David, for this wonderful <laughs> book. Thank you. Thank you very much, John.